High in the Andes, buried beneath ice for over 500 years, archaeologists uncovered something no one thought possible, the perfectly preserved body of a young Inca girl. Her skin, hair, even the contents of her stomach remain intact, frozen in time since the 1500s. Scientists call her one of the best preserved mummies ever found. So lifelike it looks as if she's merely sleeping. But the discovery has sparked a disturbing question. With modern genetic technology, could she one day be brought back to life? And if so, should we? At first glance, this sounds like pure science fiction. But the truth is far stranger. Unlike the desiccated mummies of Egypt, whose fragile remains are skeletal and brittle, the Lulayako maiden, sometimes called La Doncella, retains soft tissue, flowing hair, even intact blood cells. Her body was so well preserved by the extreme cold and thin air that researchers have been able to study her as if she passed away only yesterday. In fact, forensic analysis revealed that she suffered from a respiratory infection at the time of her death, a diagnosis made half a millennium after her final breath. Such microscopic detail is staggering, and it is why some scientists dare to imagine what might be possible. Here lies the hook. Frozen within her tissues may be something even more valuable than her story, her DNA. In a world racing toward breakthroughs in cloning and genetic resurrection, the temptation to consider the unthinkable grows. We live in an age where mammoth DNA is being sequenced, and serious projects exist to revive species thought lost forever. So what happens when that possibility extends not to extinct beasts, but to human beings? The context of her death is just as chilling as her preservation. The girl, believed to be around 13 or 14 years old, was chosen for a ritual known as Kappa Kocha, a ceremony where children of exceptional beauty and purity were sacrificed to the gods. Carried up to altitudes where breathing is agony, she was given maize beer and coca leaves to ease her final hours before being placed into her icy tomb, left to sleep forever in the arms of the mountains. This was not an act of cruelty in Inca eyes, but a sacred duty, a way to ensure balance between earth and sky. Yet today, her perfectly preserved face forces us to reckon with a new question, if she was sacrificed for eternity, do we dishonor that by considering her resurrection? Transition now to the science. In recent years, advances in cryogenics and genetic engineering have blurred the lines of possibility. Scientists have managed to bring cells back from decades-old frozen tissue, sparking debate about what limits truly exist. Researchers at Harvard and in Japan have already begun reactivating genes from ancient remains. If DNA can be revived, the next leap, though still far from reality, would be to use that genetic code in cloning technology. Theoretically, the frozen maiden could provide enough intact material to reconstruct a genetic twin. But here is the twist. Even if science could bring her back, it would not be her. Memory, soul, and lived experience cannot be preserved in ice. What would emerge would be something else entirely, a genetic copy, not a resurrection. Yet the idea lingers, and it is not without precedent. Consider the frozen mammoths of Siberia, their DNA already spliced with that of elephants in labs around the world. Consider how scientists recently reawakened ancient viruses from permafrost, sparking ethical debates about tampering with things long gone. Each discovery brings us closer to questions that once belonged only to myth and legend. What if the past is not as silent as we thought? But here is where awe meets caution. The maiden is more than a specimen. She is a person bound in layers of culture, history and sacred significance. Her existence connects us to an empire that once spanned the Andes to rituals that wove together earth, sky, and human devotion. To speak of her as a candidate for resurrection risks reducing her to a curiosity rather than a child once loved and lost. 
indigenous communities today remind us that she must be respected not as material for experiments, but as an ancestor. Still, as the camera lingers on her face, her lips pressed softly together, her skin unmarked by centuries, it is impossible not to feel the pull of wonder. She looks alive. She looks as if she might wake at any moment. That illusion unsettles us because it whispers of boundaries waiting to be crossed. So could she be brought back to life? Scientifically, the answer for now is no. Her body, though miraculous, is not a living vessel. But symbolically, she is alive. She speaks through the knowledge her body provides, through the history she reveals, through the ethical debates she forces us to confront. In her frozen silence, she awakens us to questions of what it means to be human, what it means to honor the dead, and how far science should go in reaching into the past. The story of the frozen Inca girl is not about resurrection, it is about reflection. She is a reminder that life is fragile, that cultures live and breathe through their rituals, and that science, while powerful, must tread carefully when standing on the threshold between memory and miracle. And yet, the haunting thought persists. As technology marches forward, as laboratories reach deeper into the genetic code of ancient beings, one cannot help but wonder. Are we approaching a future where the silence of the past is broken? Where the frozen dead of the Andes and beyond are no longer just echoes of history, but voices reborn? The answer remains hidden in the ice. But the frozen Inca maiden isn't the only relic of the past preserved in ice. Far to the north, deep in the Arctic, another frozen discovery has surfaced, one that isn't just fascinating, but deeply troubling to historians. Exploring the Arctic, especially the North Pole, is like stepping into another world. A world of ice and extreme conditions. But guess what? Thanks to some incredible technological advancements, we're not just surviving in this icy wilderness, we're actually thriving and discovering more every day. What frozen relics lay beneath the ice preserved for millennia? The ice is like a time capsule waiting to be thawed out to tell us about our ancient brothers in past. Before we get into what is frozen up there, let's get into how we get there. Take icebreakers, for instance. These aren't your average boats. They're like the Hercules of the sea, built with super strong steel hulls to muscle through ice several meters thick. And their engines? We're talking about power on a whole different level. Some of them are even nuclear powered, which means they can keep going for years without a break. It's like having the endurance of a marathon runner with the strength of a heavyweight boxer. And navigating through a maze of ice is no joke. These icebreakers are equipped with GPS and radar systems so advanced, they make your car's navigation look like a child's toy. They find the best and safest paths through the ice, avoiding any nasty surprises that might be waiting. Now let's talk about what these icebreakers can do apart from breaking ice. Many of them are like floating science labs packed with equipment for all kinds of research. Imagine being able to study the ocean and drill into ancient ice, all from the comfort of your boat. It's like having a time machine and a science lab all in one. But what about when you need to get around on land? That's where the real fun begins. We've got snowmobiles and all-terrain vehicles that have been beefed up for the Arctic. Think of them as the monster trucks of the snow world, with heated controls and extra-wide tracks for gliding over ice and snow. And for the heavy-duty stuff, there are these tracked vehicles, kind of like tanks, but for science. They're the ultimate in off-road vehicles, able to carry teams and their gear over the toughest terrain you can imagine. Staying warm and safe out there is a whole science in itself. The gear explorers wear and use is nothing short of amazing. We're talking about clothing and sleeping bags made from materials that are not only super warm but also light and flexible. It's like being wrapped in a high-tech blanket that's also weatherproof. And the tents, they're like fortresses against the wind and snow. The middle of the Arctic, a place so remote and vast that it feels like you're on another planet. Now think about staying connected in such a place. Sounds like a sci-fi movie, right? But here's where our incredible technology comes into play. First off, we've got satellite phones. 
These aren't your average smartphones. They're like lifelines to the outside world, working in the coldest of colds, ensuring that no matter where you are in this icy wilderness, you can reach out and touch someone, metaphorically speaking. And then there's GPS, the global positioning system. This is like the ultimate compass, but way more high tech. In the Arctic, where everything around you is just snow and ice, GPS devices are what keep you on track, literally. They tell you where you are, where you're going, and how to get back. It's like having a personal guide who knows every inch of this frozen world. Now let's talk about radios. We're using shortwave and VHF radios, which might sound old school, but they're super reliable. These radios are perfect for when you need to chat with someone nearby, or when those high-tech satellites decide to play hide-and-seek. It's like having a trusty sidekick that's always ready to go. But wait, there's more. We've got these automated weather stations scattered around, and they are like our eyes and ears in the Arctic. They're loaded with sensors that measure all sorts of things about the weather, giving us real-time updates. It's crucial because out here, the weather can change in the blink of an eye, and being prepared is the difference between a successful expedition and a disaster. These stations are pretty much self-sufficient running remotely and sending us data via satellite. So even when we're not there, we're still getting updates. It's like having a guardian watching over the Arctic, keeping an eye on things. Now you know the Arctic, with its vast frozen landscapes and harsh conditions, is like Planet Hoth from Star Wars except right here on Earth. But get this, humans have been calling this icy frontier home for thousands of years. It's a story that's as incredible as it is inspiring. Way back during the last Ice Age, we're talking about something like 20,000 to 40,000 years ago, the first adventurous souls made their way into the Arctic. Imagine that time. It was an era when mammoth and saber-toothed tigers roamed, and these hunter-gatherers followed them over land bridges like the one that existed between what's now Russia and Alaska. They were living a life on the move, in a world where the sun barely rose in winter. Then, when the Ice Age packed its bags and left, around 11,700 years ago, things started warming up a bit. This change revealed new, habitable lands, and people began to settle down, building communities and really getting to know their chilly neighborhood. We found tools and all sorts of stuff from these ancient Arctic folks, giving us a peek into how they transitioned from life on the go to setting up shop. Over thousands of years, several cultures popped up in the Arctic. The Paleo-Eskimos, with their top-notch tool-making skills, were like the first wave. Then, around a thousand years ago, the Thule culture emerged, who were the ancestors of today's Inuit people. They were like the Arctic innovators, coming up with cool stuff like dog sleds, now surviving in the Arctic. It's not like living anywhere else. These folks were the MacGyvers of their time, building igloos out of snow blocks. Genius. They're warm, sturdy, and the design is so clever it keeps the cold out and the cozy in. And they figured out how to heat these places with oil lamps without turning them into saunas. Then there's the whole food situation. They weren't just hunting. They were crafting specialized tools like harpoons and bows, tailored for Arctic conditions. And talk about transport. They had kayaks and umiaks for water and sleds for snow, all animal-powered. Diving into the mysteries of the Arctic Ocean is like unlocking the secrets of an alien world right here on Earth. Beneath the icy surface, there's a whole landscape of underwater mountains, and it's as mind-blowing as any cosmic mystery. Thanks to some really high-tech submarines and remotely operated vehicles, we've been able to get a glimpse of these hidden giants. These machines are like our deep-sea eyes, equipped with sonar and imaging systems that bring the unseen into view. Navigating these icy waters is no walk in the park. It's a world of extreme cold, shifting ice and remote locations. But despite these challenges, we've managed to map out an incredible underwater terrain that's got valleys, peaks and ridges, much like the mountain ranges on land. Now let's talk about what these mountains are made of. We've got a mix of rocks like basalt and granite down there. Some of these formations are even volcanic, hinting at fiery pasts beneath these frozen waters. It's like finding clues to a long lost world. The way these mountains came to be is a tale of Earth's inner workings, the shifting and shuffling of tectonic plates, creating and shaping these massive structures. It's a story that's been unfolding for millions of years, written in stone under the sea. But here's the really fascinating part. These underwater mountains aren't just geological wonders. They're like the beating heart of the Arctic marine life. They influence ocean currents and create spots where cold, nutrient-rich waters come up to the surface. 
This process is like setting the table for a grand feast, attracting all sorts of marine life and making these areas hotspots for biodiversity. You've got everything from tiny plankton to big marine mammals and birds, all thriving thanks to these underwater giants. Studying these ranges isn't just about mapping the seafloor, it's about understanding the complex web of life in these icy waters, and there's a bigger picture too. These mountain ranges are like the canaries in the coal mine for climate change. Changes in water temperature and ice cover can shake up the whole system, affecting the currents and the life that depends on them. These underwater mountain ranges in the Arctic is like piecing together a puzzle that stretches from the depths of the earth to the surface of the sea. Exploring the Arctic's ice caps and glaciers is like unraveling a story that's been frozen in time, literally. It's an icy world up there, but it holds secrets that could tell us a lot about our planet's past and future. One of the coolest ways we get to know these icy giants is by drilling into them. We take these long cylinders of ice called ice cores and they're like time capsules. Each layer is a snapshot of a different era, going back thousands, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of years. It's like having a history book written in snow and ice. These ice cores are amazing. They've got trapped air bubbles, tiny particles, and even isotopes that give us the lowdown on what the Earth's atmosphere was like way back when. Think about it, we can learn about ancient volcanic eruptions and past temperature changes, all from a piece of ice. It's like being a detective, but for climate history. And then there's the way these ice caps and glaciers move. It's not just a slow crawl. We're talking about a complex dance influenced by the temperature, ocean currents, winds, and even the shape of the land and seafloor underneath. The way to keep an eye on this. Satellites. These high-tech eyes in the sky give us a bird's eye view of how the ice is flowing and changing over time. It's like watching a slow motion ballet from space. But why does all this matter? Well, the way these ice masses move and change is a big deal for understanding our planet's climate system. It's not just about the Arctic, it's about the whole Earth. The way ice caps and glaciers respond to climate change can tell us a lot about what's in store for our planet. Plus, their melting has a direct impact on sea levels worldwide. It's like piecing together a puzzle that connects the icy poles to the rest of the world. So studying the Arctic's ice is more than just a chilly adventure. It's a journey into Earth's past and a guide to understanding its future. And the more we learn, the better we can prepare for what's coming. It's a story written in ice, and every discovery is another piece of the puzzle. Isn't that just mind-blowing?